Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. This podcast is sponsored by Small Farm University, the go-to resource for gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers around the world. Small Farm University delivers classes online and on demand with training on how to grow crops and how to grow a profitable farm business that serves you, your family, and your community well. Delivered by real farmers with hands-on experience and expertise, it's unique in its approach, using the RIPED method for growing and building a farm or farm business. SFU membership includes access to a private Facebook group and monthly live Q&A sessions where you can get your questions answered and find the support you need. To learn more, visit growingfarmers.com today. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Alex Miller, who is the CEO and chairman of the board of Lick Skillet Farm in East Tennessee. Alex is a seventh generation farmer and a chaired professor of business at the University of Tennessee. Along with his children and grandchildren, he farms a 104 year old family farm using regenerative practices and is passionate about mentoring the next generation of farmers on sustainable agriculture. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Yeah. So Alex, again, the name of your farm, that's a little unusual. Give us a little bit of history behind that. My uh, grandfather purchased uh, the, the, our family's first piece of land. We'd been farming in East Tennessee for seven, seven generations, but always as sharecroppers or tenant farmers mm. could accumulate any capital to buy some land. He finally made enough to buy a worn out hillside farm. And uh, in, in 1919, and one of the neighbors pulled him aside and, and fed him lunch. And, and the missus, uh, Mrs. Baker's, the, the Baker's mm-hmm. family still are neighbors. Mrs. Baker pulled him aside and said, young man, we're delighted to have you as a neighbor, but you can't make a go of it on that farm. It's too worn out. You'll starve to death. Your children will be licking the skillet. <laughs> we became, okay. We became lick skillet farm at that point. He raised 10 kids on the farm and, and it's been growing ever since. Very cool. Very cool. So well, give us a little bit of background for you. So when you kind of started growing, did you grow up on the farm? Yes. Okay. And then at that point, when you were growing up, what kind of crops was the farm producing? We're primarily uh, beef and tobacco. We kept some beef just to keep the place picked down and we made our money raising tobacco. We were one of the largest burley producers in our county. And um, when the, the whole burley and tobacco industry changed, we got out of the tobacco business, started focusing on cattle. We were pretty conventional cattle producers. We were doing some, some work on um, rotational grazing, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. but just very preliminary steps. We were raising uh, calves here and then sending them out to Nebraska to finish them. We would retain ownership there. And, and sell them directly to the packing houses. But other than that, we weren't doing anything different. And then uh, middle of the, the uh, last decade, uh, when we realized we we're about to turn 100 and we had a family meeting to discuss it, the next 100 years, we decided that uh, that, that form of farming really didn't suit us and it wasn't sustainable either environmentally or economically. So we made some pretty dramatic changes and uh, decided to go direct to consumer with, uh, with a different type of product than we'd produced before. Interesting. Okay. And so then, but you're also, um, you are also a professor. So talk to us a little bit <laughs> yeah. about, um, so I'm assuming then you went to college and became a professor right away, or what was your actual journey? So my my family has always been big on education. Um, mm-hmm. My, um, uh, my, we've always invested heavily in education, going all, all the way back to my grandfather. And so both my brother and I, who are partners in, in one of our farms, uh, we both have PhDs and then came back to the farm to, to actually uh, farm. Like a lot of farmers in, 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 in Tennessee, we're flashlight farmers. We have a day job and then we farm at night and on the weekends. And uh, that's what uh, I, I've sort of spent my whole life doing. But now uh, there's more and more emphasis being placed with the family on the farm and, and we're growing it. And, and so it's taking more time. But uh, I'm a business school professor at, at the University of Tennessee. I've never had a, a, an ag course in my life. A lot of people assume that I'm an agricultural professor, but no, I, I approach this for, as a business standpoint instead of a, an agricultural business, uh, agricultural standpoint. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then with the, the business, what kind do you speak, teach specific business courses or? <laughs> Ironically, uh, my focus right now is on nonprofits and the joke of course is that well, working with farms gives you a lot of experience with nonprofits, but the I, I'm nonprofits are an important part of our economy that are largely overlooked by business schools. So that's where I've been mm. focused for the last 10 years. Interesting. Now that is fascinating. Um, we started a nonprofit back in, I'm trying to think what year it was. It had to have been, I think, 2014, 2015. Um, I and we were the, one of the founding members, and I've been off that board now for gosh, five or six years. Um, but um we preserved a 166 acre farm inside the spring, the city limits of Saratoga Springs, New York. Wow. So, yeah, that was, it was a, I think a $2 million purchase right around there. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the board, again, they've done a fabulous job of paying that off. And actually they paid off the farm purchase in a couple, I think two or three years. Um, now, since then, you know, kind of the direction of the farm is, you know, I, I, I feel like it kind of has left the original vision. Um, but, um, you know, again, the, to me, the important part is that land has been preserved and it will never be farms because it's incredibly high um, I mean, yeah, if we hadn't gotten to it, that would have been a hundred track homes right there. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, well, that's, that's, what's happening all across Tennessee. I'm sort of on a one man crusade to, to, uh, save family farms in Tennessee, but Tennessee is the second most threatened state in the nation in terms of lost farmland, second only to Texas. And, um, we've, when my, I did a hundred year look at, at farming in Tennessee and when my grandfather was first started in 1919 there are 280,000 farms in Tennessee mm. 100 years later we were down to 60 I think it was 66,000 farms if you do the math that's a farm lost every four hours for a century wow okay yeah. so let's dive into that because that's the okay. staggering fact why is that happening combination of things uh of course it all gets back to economics um, uh, land prices have just soared as everybody wants to move to the country and, and mm -hmm. own their one to five acre little farmette. Uh, and we have policies that facilitate that in our county, for example, you cannot have a home plot that's less than 0.93 acres. Well, it's just chewing up farmland. This you, wow. you can't have a density of your population to save farmland if you've got those sorts of policies. So that's that's part of it. It's just there's tremendous demand for uh, residential uh, living in, in what were once countryside. And I understand yeah. that. I mean, I always wanted to live in the country, too. I suspect you do. And but, you know, it's it's a it's a hard yeah. thing to maintain farms when everybody wants to live in farm country. It just it, the math of it doesn't work. And the other thing is that farming is just a really tough business. Um, mm -hmm. You get a feel for what it's uh, like. Um, Again, I did this 100-year analysis. When my grandfather started, uh, in, uh, in, in today's terms, he was his biggest cash crop was the cattle, and he was oh. getting $1.50 a, a pound for steers. And his biggest expense, of course, was a capital investment in land, and he paid $840 an acre. Wow. Today, if you look at the, the cattle prices for the last five years on commodity markets, they are $1.50. It hasn't changed one bit. But land prices are up to about, in today's uh, prices, up to about 12,500 an acre around here. That's a 14, it's 14 times the expense for land while the, the biggest revenue generator hasn't changed a dime. The economics of that just don't make sense. And if you look at the what's going on downstream of the, the farm producer, the latest research says that on average, farmers are capturing 7.8 cents out of the food dollar spent in the United States. That's a completely unworkable system. You, uh -huh. you, so people look at that and just say, I can't farm. It just doesn't make any sense to farm. So between the demand for the land from non-farmers and the economics facing farmers, it's an inevitability that we're going to lose more and more farms unless we, we have some fairly dramatic changes. So, uh -huh. Absolutely. So I just ran the numbers on that. That would be a thousand pound steer in today's term if you were using 19... Uh, 19 pricing, it should be about $21,000, which is absolutely crazy when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you want the same sort of yeah. uh, multiple, that's exactly what you'd have to get. And and wow. you know, not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. Um, so, I mean, obviously, too, I don't, I, one of the things I also feel like is that there's a lack of solid agricultural training. Um, I'm not saying that it's not out there because I know there's some absolute great 
agricultural trainers, but I think we also have an aspect of where a lot of kids are encouraged not to go to that training so that when they do end up going to become a farmer, they don't have any of that training under the belts. That's true. And uh, and being a college professor, I, I let me be the first to throw stones at, at the university's glass houses. I, I think that a lot of the training that's available from universities it buys into uh, industrialization of, of farming mm -hmm. and uh, and assumes that you're producing a commodity product, mm -hmm. and assumes that you're doing very extractive types of, of, uh, of farming. And I don't think any of those are recipes for success in, in today's marketplace. Uh, it's, you know, we, we just went to a, a, a program last week that was talking about uh, how important it was to uh, eradicate any weeds from your pasture lands and uh, oh, make gosh. sure that you're planting the, the latest mm -hmm. and greatest forages. And, you know, the, the forages that they were suggesting have less <laughs> nutrients than the, than the weeds that they're trying to get rid of and the weeds mm -hmm. are available for free. So, yeah, this, this, that, that mentality is not what young people uh, need. On the other hand, Michael, I, I would say that being around young people every day on, on my day job, I've never known a generation to be more committed to the values that I think it takes to be a good farmer and 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 the, just the interest and the passion around farming and, and food security as a cause. I, I think there there's an endless supply of young people who want to get into farming. It just so happens that economics right now is a horrible time to get into farming. And much of the training, I think, is uh, is yesterday's news. It's, well, and I, it's I out of step. yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And the other thing we're facing too, is they typically go to a four year degree and then get themselves a hundred, a hundred few thousand dollars in debt. And now yeah. they can't afford to farm because farming, again, as you know, you can make a good income, but it's not like an income where you're going to pay back your uh, loans really fast as well. Yeah. That's uh higher education has gotten very expensive. So I, I think that there are solutions other than four year degrees. I think the sort of training that you're doing makes a lot of sense. I think there are other people that are, are doing very applied uh, training that uh, it would, would be very different from what you would get in, in a four-year institution. And um, I, 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 I am a college professor, but I do not recommend that people say, well, the way to get into farming is to go get a four-year degree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have seen a few kind of alternative farms that I felt were doing a fair job with training folks, but it, it's very hard to have the intersection of uh, because really what they really kids need to do is they need to go get a business degree, a two year business degree, and then they should do a two year um, farming degree. And I think that would really then set them up. And my mentor told me, you know, first, Michael, you're a marketer, then a business person, and then finally you're a farmer. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Uh, and I would somewhere in there that I would add, you are a manager and a leader of people and organizations. Oh, yeah. I, Absolutely. I used to say that marketing was the most difficult part of, about farming. Um, I, I, the business side of it and the uh, and the production side of it are clearly easier than the marketing. But now I say, well, even more difficult than the marketing is the people side. If you if you're really trying to grow a a, a business, not mm -hmm. just manage a single farm, but grow a business, uh, and, and that employs that that implies employees and 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 all the the problems and challenges that come with that. I, I think the people part of it is is incredibly uh, difficult, and I I I don't know how much training there is out there on that. Well, you, you're right, and I think there's a lot of people that can talk theory about you know do this, do this, do this, but you know you really can't teach that aspect of how to care and build a team. Um, and I know there's been a number of books written on a lot of these topics. I mean, if you look at like the Jack Welch, Jack Welch was all, always trimmed temp the bottom ten percent every year. And yeah. I, really, you know, there's I, I think different people have different skills, and a lot of time maybe those ten percent on the bottom there, they're ten percent bottom because they're actually helping the other people achieve the 150 percent mm. and well you know it comes back to i mean we always are hiring first and we've been very right now we're really lucky with the team we have but it really comes back to get the people that want to be on your bus or on on your on your team mm -hmm. and then then you go in from there because again farming is really it's not one of those things where it's completely profit driven it's no. um it's something that really kind of you do it because you love it and you're trying to create a better future and um, yeah, 
So yeah, you're absolutely right. T people is the most challenging part of it. Right. And it's very hard to get training on that. Yeah. I, I think just to underline something you said, I, I look at farming as a cause, not just a career. And mm -hmm. it needs to be a career. But in order for it to be a decent career, it also has to be the cause. And, and that's what excites me about this current generation. I think there are a lot of young people that want to have mm -hmm. farming as both their cause and the career. And, and so I'm, I'm excited about those, those sorts of folks. And, and really, see, I define my job as the CEO and chairman of, of Lixco. I, I, I view myself as something of a venture capitalist. Mm. I, my job is to find talent and to match it with capital and allow people to uh, express their their values. Mm -hmm. their, if their values have to be in line with our values on the farm, but if they are, then we're a good way to make a value statement to the world while making a decent living. And packaging that all that together is pretty much a full time job. Just just the the, the financing and the talent piece, people mm -hmm. uh, part of it. It's it's very very difficult work. Mm. Very cool. All right. Now let's move a little bit over to, so right now your farm is mostly a pasture-based farm. So kind of share a little bit about kind of like the products you sell and how you sell them. Mm -hmm. We do 100% uh, grass finished uh, ruminants. So that's uh, beef and, and uh, lamb. And then our uh, monogastrics are the pork and, uh, and chicken. Those are all pasture-based, but we also feed uh, uh, supplemental feed. Our mm -hmm. feed is no corn, no soy. Uh, so that's sort of our niche. Mm -hmm. And we're uh, big emphasis on the environment and a big emphasis on um, uh, animal welfare. But all of it's focused on delivering the most delicious food that we possibly can uh, produced in a way that's sustainable and, and friendly to animals and those sorts of things. So that's that's what we're about. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about the no corn and soy. So are you doing a lot of uh, small grains or what does that typically mean for your protein sources there? Yeah, it, it, there are small grains. Uh, we do. Um, we, it, it is a real challenge to do no corn, no soy. When we started, we were able to get winter peas as a source mm -hmm. of uh, protein. Right now, the winter pea market is very high. So we're using some uh, uh, canola uh, meal as a protein source. We also use some fish meal. Okay. Uh, the uh, protein is is a is a real challenge. We every day uh, it seems like we're arguing with ourselves. Do we really want to stay no corn, no soy? But we have customers that that really value that, uh, and so so far that's that's where we're staying. But it is a, uh, a, a it's a marketing question. It's also a values question for the for the family. And um, right now we're we're going to stay in that in that domain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so then with your pasture chicken, do you do all the different parts or do you do only whole birds? No, we do uh, cut up birds. We prefer to do, if we could get our, our uh, production consistent enough, we would probably do 100% cut up birds just because there's a, a better margin on those. Mm -hmm. But um, we take our, our smallest birds and turn them into uh, whole birds. And then we take our largest birds and we grind those for a variety of different chicken sausages and that sort of thing. Yeah. We actually carry chicken sausages in our store and they've been very popular. Yeah. I, I think that's a real opportunity. We're just now putting the toe in the water with a very small experiment on turkeys. And I mm. think there's a big opportunity for a, a year round uh, ground turkey product. Yeah, probably. Absolutely. All right. So then you have a, a significant team and we kind of touched on team a little bit ago. Let's kind of talk a little bit about how have you set up the different departments of your business um, to let people thrive in their roles? Yeah, we're organized uh, we're into a, a, a collection of enterprises and uh, we have crews associated with each enterprise. So we do right now, we, we, we expect it have more named enterprise owners and managers in the future. But right now we have the the what we call the field team, which is out in the pastures with the, the sheep and, and the beef. Mm -hmm. And then we have the barn team, which is handling the uh, the uh, pork and, and the chicken production. And all those are, are still pasture based, but there's a they're more centrally located. So we call them the barn team. Then we also have a uh, a sales and order fulfillment team. And then finally, there's an admin team that uh, is just overhead. Uh, and each of those folks have designated responsibilities. And our vision is we want to find 
uh, young people who want to be in farming but couldn't possibly afford to buy into farming right now, and then to set them up so that they can become a successful enterprise owner here on the farm. We've got, we're approaching 1,200 acres now of, of land, and everybody, all the enterprises share the same back office, the same marketing, same legal, same accounting, all that sort of thing. And, um, but they, they each have their own product or, or work that they are, are accountable for. And by doing it as a team effort, we're able to give people something really important that they wouldn't have if they were trying to do it on their own. And that's time off. Mm. You know, as, as well as I do, given your, your background and your startup, how valuable it is to be able to take some time off. If, you, if you're not part of a team, if you haven't thought consciously about how you're going to get away from the farm, you will never get away from the farm. And in that case, farming just becomes prison for good people. Mm, you're think, you're yeah. locked you're locked up and there will never be an instant when in the back of your mind you aren't saying i really need to be doing this and mm -hmm. i'm speaking from personal experience here I, in order for me to get away from the farm mentally i would have to i would have to get away from the farm physically like go so far away that i couldn't drive back real quickly mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. when the a neighbor calls and said hey the cattle are out you're going to zip home and take care of it and it, that will just burn you out. I don't care how committed you are to the cause. If, if you can't get some downtime away from that, it will burn you out. So doing it as running these crews that are all cross trained, we have a schedule and everybody gets a, a weekend off a month and two days off of a, 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 a week. And I think that's, that is a really valuable and often overlooked part of, of being a, a part of a, a larger farm team. Mm. No, I think that's a great way to look at it. So then let's talk about your, your um, sales. Like where does your product, where do you sell your product? We are primarily e-commerce. Uh, we're selling through um, on online markets. We use the Grace Cart platform as, as our, uh, our e-commerce platform. And we, when we f uh, began all of this journey, what, five or seven years ago now, uh, we, or if, if we have a strategy, it was try a lot of stuff and keep what works. And so we we tried a, a wide range of, of products. We tried to, a variety of different channels. Uh, we just a lot to learn about all this. And now over time, we're starting to narrow down. We're uh, reducing the number of SKUs that we offer on our platform and also reducing the number of channels. We won't um, you know, make a big use of the Pareto principle. We're always looking for the 20% of the products that account for 80% of the sales make sure that we have those. And then there are some weird products, the odd bits that, uh, that we love the, the idea of using the whole animal, but mm -hmm. we just can't, we freezer space is so expensive and energy costs are so high that we, we can't justify doing it. So we're right now we're exploring opportunities to set up a dog food business to use some of those odd bits. We don't want to discard them, but we can't, mm -hmm we can't affordably uh, offer them to our, our, mark, our, our normal customers. So that's sort of where we are right now in, in our focus. But we, we would like to be 100% online. We deliver everything to the door. Um, and that's, that's sort of the direction we're heading in. Mm -hmm. So then for local deliveries, do you um, deliver yourselves or do you ship through like a FedEx or UPS? We have done a little bit of everything in that try everything and see what works uh, stage. We we had a partnership with a local uh, delivery company. We did some deliveries ourselves. We had on-farm pickup. Uh, we had drop spots, you name it, we've tried it. Where we're going to is simplifying the business so that we can continue to grow it and to simplify, simplify it and streamline it, standardize it. We're probably looking at 100% UPS shipping in the future. Okay. Wow. So that literally everything would go off. Now, don't you also have? I'm a sorry. Uh, let me make, let me correct that. For people who buy shares, so we we sell our products two ways. We sell it by the piece through a subscription program. Okay. Uh, and then we also sell by the share. Folks who buy shares, uh, they're they're into the farm enough that they like coming to the farm and picking up their shares. So that's the way we'll we'll handle shares. Gotcha. So they'll still come to the farm for that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, and then is processing done with a local USDA or? We wish. We wish it were local. Okay. It is. It all. It's all done the USDA. But um, let's see. We have 
one of the processors is six hour trip to get there and back. And the other one, I guess they're both about six hours round trip to get to them and back. So we don't have the, um, we don't have enough USDA processors. And in particular, we don't have enough of, of the USDA inspected processors that are doing really high quality work and doing it consistently. The, the processing business is just terribly, terribly complex and difficult to run. The labor situation is, is very challenging. Talk about a place where uh, the people issues are, are a paramount importance. Getting someone who can consistently cut and pack meat and the way that you need it to be cut and packed and the way that your website says it's cut and packed, that's just a real challenge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so then with that, I'm assuming that it's made you kind of, as you said, you're streamlining what you're offering just because of part of that is just because it's challenging to get it processed. Yeah, and it, it, it let's just give you an example. If you've got processors that are cutting meat just a little bit differently, then you can end up with uh, a, a product that doesn't meet your product specifications. Suddenly, that's a whole new skew. Mm. So yeah, it's we've had different. What should be the same cut has to be listed on the on the uh, website in two different skews, and part of that is because we were we had some pretty big and complex cut sheets. They were handing off to these processors and then they had constant turnover in their workforce mm -hmm. and you get somebody new on the job and they'd, they'd look at a cut sheet and say, okay, this is the way I'm interpreting that. And the next thing, you know, you've got, you know, meat back from processing 12 different steers <laughs> and it was a cut you've never seen before. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was poorly butchered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know that is something that is is I think across the US is just a challenge, is the processing side. And that's something that um I hope they would address. And I, I've seen a few some a glimmers of hope in a few different places, but I'm not confident that we're gonna see any, any big changes anytime soon. For us, the, the key has been not to wait on those changes because I know the changes are in the works. I know the USDA is spending a lot of money on this. It's a, a major priority of, of the current administration and a lot of money's flowing in that direction. Yeah. But it's going to be a long time before those get billed out. And even if they get billed out, I'm not so sure that 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 numbers of processors alone will deal with the underlying process problem that we're talking about, which is just the consistency of the product that they're that they're producing. Um, yes, correct. So we're, what we're doing is instead of waiting on that solution, we're just getting in real, real strong partnerships with a couple of of processors, and we want we invest heavily in mm -hmm. working with those two. We used to work with I don't know at one time we probably were using six different processors all at the same time, and now we use two, and uh, we are uh, really in close with them, and and you know, and, and they understand what we're trying to do, and and. Uh, and we understand how important they are to, to making that happen. Yeah, gotcha. So you're really focusing on building that relationship so it's a long term and they know exactly what you're looking for. And yeah, and but unfortunately, a, a big part of the reason they're able to do that is they are horribly expensive. I mean, we 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 pay a really pretty penny uh, to get our animals processed. And uh, but we have consumers that uh, that appreciate it and. You know, in the market that we're in, we only sell to people who care dearly about their food. Mm -hmm. If they're just buying food from us as an alternative to, yeah, I can either go to the grocery store, or I can go to this farmer's market and buy this food. Uh, that's that's not our, our consumers. Our consumers are those that uh, have a deeply held set of values that make them want to buy a particular type of food. And if so if our costs go up because of our, our processing, uh, if, as long as it's done, in a way that the customers approve, they're willing to support it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This podcast is sponsored by Small Farm University, the go-to resource for gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers around the world. Small Farm University delivers classes online and on demand with training on how to grow crops and how to grow a profitable farm business that serves you, your family, and your community well.
Applying what you learn in SFU could save you thousands of hours and thousands of dollars. And it can save you the agony of costly mistakes some make just because they don't know what they don't know. Delivered by real farmers with hands-on experience and expertise, it is unique in its approach, using the ripened method for growing and building a farm or farm business. Here are a few highlights of what SFU has to offer in its growing library of resources. Find your perfect farm property. Whether you're renting or purchasing, this course guides you through vetting the farm property and determining how or if it suits your business needs. We give you the secret sauce for what makes a profitable farm property and help save you thousands of dollars. Start your farm intensive. Fleshing out your farm idea, craft your one-page business plan, and discover the right funding options for your business. Use our business templates, worksheets, and calculators to figure out the numbers as you go. Farmer's Market Success System. Learn how to attract and convert customers by building an unstoppable marketing and business system for your farmer's markets. Production Mastery Series. Learn all about growing, harvesting, and drying greens. Learn about tunnel building and take special classes such as brand new and very popular Elderberry Masterclass. We include real-life examples and calculators for figuring out fertility rates, how much money you are actually making, and where your profit is coming from. Business Systems and Marketing Courses. Learn about the SFU Ripen Formula for Success, develop your marketing plan, and join in for behind-the-scenes tours of real farm businesses. Learn the systems you need to run your business well and how to hire a team to help you. And learn how you can add value to what you produce to generate even more income with minimal additional time and expense. In addition, members of SFU get access to the Growing Farmer Summits on demand with over 100 sessions of targeted areas of interest to farmers. These annual online events have attracted over 100,000 people from around the world, and they are included in your SFU membership as a bonus. SFU membership includes access to a private member group, monthly group Q&A sessions, and even one-on-one coaching sessions where you can get your questions answered and find the support you need. To learn more, visit growingfarmers.com today. Now, outside of the farm, you have a couple different interests too. I kind of wanted to talk about that because a second ago, we were talking about making sure you got time off mm-hmm. and you're, you've got you know mountaineering, whitewater, scuba, but I also saw ultra endurance bicycling. Huh. What does that look like? I mean, like how far are we talking? You're reading a, a, a dated uh, bio back in, uh, in, in, in two, uh, 10 years ago now, I yeah. was uh, heavily, heavily into uh, ultra endurance. I had just watched my father die of cancer and realized, my gosh, I'm getting to be an old man myself and decided in, in my late fifties that I was going to do something about it. So I took up ultra endurance and ultra endurance. You don't start recording anything in, until you've done at least, I don't know, 200 K something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, 120 miles maybe is where you start measuring. And then the rides go, uh, 24 hours is a, is a pretty common thing. Um, uh, race across America's is, is the granddaddy of them all. And you mm. race, um, we raced in a four man team from, uh, San Diego to Annapolis in six days and 21 hours or something like that. So, wow. yeah, so long what- distances. What does your calorie food intake have to be to make that possible? Uh, <laughs> it's the two things that determine whether or not you can do it. Well, actually three. The one is just a tolerance for pain and, and how dogged you, you are and sticking yeah. with it when you're hurting. But the other two is your ability to sleep and, and sleep well and, and in and places that other people wouldn't consider sleeping. Can you catch a, a cat? Nap yeah. And, rejuv- and then, of course, your stomach and your stomach needs to be able to handle um a lot of calories <laughs> yeah <laughs> that way I, I mean not as much as the pros i mean we're just seeing the tour de france wrap up now and, and those guys are i mean you hear numbers of 6500 calories a day or things like that and i don't know how how their stomach yeah. put up with that but yeah it's it's a lot of calories very interesting um so then um with that though i'm assuming that some of that training kind of helped you f- realize the importance of good nutrition it does. Yes, absolutely. It'll teach you uh, those sorts of sports will teach you two things. One is uh, just the, the understanding that it's a, uh, it's an endurance race. It's, it's don't sprint, just get in there and slug away at it and keep, keep working. And mm. uh, when times are bad, just keep moving, they'll get better. And, and that's an important part of farming is, is 
being able to, to tolerate the roller coaster nature. I mean, you're, mm. you, you one one day you're on absolute high and everything's working great, and the next day it just all comes tumbling down, and you just have to keep on a steady kill. And and endurance uh, cycling is is helps with that. But yeah, the importance of food is and and in particular uh, nutritional nutritionally dense food is uh, mm -hmm. that's. I think more and more the world is coming to understand that a, a lot of our so-called food is in fact not food at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, uh, uh, I, I don't know what to call it. We need to come up with a new word. Well, it's a filler. Fake food. It, it's a, it, yeah, it's, but it's even worse than that. It's a, it's, it's something designed to entice you to consume it on a frequent basis even though all you're getting from it is this pleasure sensation. It, it's not doing you any good. And, uh, yeah. and we're calling that food. And it's, 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 it's a terrible thing to see what's happening. Um, we, I, I just returned from uh, Europe where um, the obesity rates in parts that we were in were nowhere near what they are in the United States. And the minute you hit, hit the U.S. soil again, you just realize, holy cow, what is our food industry? doing mm. for our health and and how can people who produce these products live with themselves just walking around and seeing what what these mm -hmm. non-food products are doing to people when they consume them as, as opposed to nutritionally dense food it's it's a horrifying picture absolutely and i, I think it's interesting because i was recently looking at the obesity rates and actually the u.s starts to, is starting to drop as not the most obese nations but what you look at is a lot of these very undeveloped com countries that are starting to see food com companies move in and yeah. start marketing and there's even less regulation than there is in the u.s and so they're even allowed to sell them even worse as you said filler yeah uh, it, uh, it's almost like a drug sensation filler because exactly uh, right because an basically it, yeah. it's an addictive filler that they're eating they're not actually eating like real food right. um and I, I think what it is too because like um i noticed lately my sugar intake um it really in fat and impacts and one of the things we have in the farm store now is we have um slushies that we we do a strawberry slushy and we did a lavender slushy and they're actually there's three ingredients so it's actually very good for you it's only like lemonade which is a very clean organic lemonade and fruit and sugar but when you still think about how much sugar is in each thing there's a, there's still a, a fair amount yeah well the the sugar makes you not feel great and then because mm -hmm. you don't feel great, you're like, well, I deserve another slushy. And yep. so it's this, it's this vicious cycle. Right. right. That's an addictive nature. That's it's it's a great, it's yeah. a great product. And and what you're saying about the developing nations, that's true in the United States too. If you look, there's a there's this triangle between poverty, hunger, and obesity. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. think, well, wait a minute, you can't have people that are hungry and obese. Well, you can if you're feeding them junk, addictive mm -hmm. junk food. And the yeah. and the addictive junk food. Because it is a non-food, is an industrial produced product. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can buy it and fill your gut with it much more cheaply than you can nutritionally dense food. So uh, it is a it, it it's a I don't know it just keeps coming back to that word horrifying. It's a horrifying situation. Well, and it's really interesting because, and it's even getting worse. And I'll say this exactly why is because you've had some major. Um, malfeasance and rioting and looting in some of these cities and so you even have a further moving of any even decent uh grocery store that had anything halfway helpful and so now they're going to the very limited availability of what's available and most of these stores it's basically soda chips and and candy yeah here in tennessee we uh you probably haven't seen as much of that yeah the, the no the, the grocery store chain that is growing most rapidly in Tennessee are the, are the dollar general stores. Oh. And uh, we're getting the density of a, about a, a dollar general store every, I would say every six miles on all the major roads. And really, yeah, yeah. Uh, and their food selection is just exactly what you described. It, 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 they, they simply aren't set up Mm -hmm. to have uh, a wide variety of, of fresh and, and and healthy foods it's just not their niche I, I mean I'm I'm not knocking them that's just that's yeah a dollar general store is supposed to be a dollar general store correct unfortunately they're they are so convenient I mean you you can drive 
uh, from where I'm sitting right now, you can drive two miles to two different dollar stores, or you can drive 10 miles in one direction to a grocery store or 25 miles in the other direction to No, I'm sorry, 15 miles in the other direction to a grocery store. And where do you think a lot of people are going for their so-called yeah. groceries? Well, and so like I'm sitting here, where I'm sitting, it's a quarter mile to the Dollar General. Um, we're getting a new Dollar Tree, which will be yep. a half mile away. Yep. Um, then I've got two gas stations within a quarter mile. Right. Um, the closest grocery store, actual, that would be called an actual grocery store is probably six or seven miles away, but we have a Walmart that's closer. So that's a superstore. That, so that would have a full line of food. Mm -hmm. um, so that's only like four miles away, but it's still interesting when you think about it. Again, we're lucky because we're very urban and we actually are really lucky within, you know, 15 miles. We have it's probably less than 15. Yeah. 15 miles. We have a Costco. We have a, you know, Sam's club. We have actually several nice butchers. So we're really lucky where mm -hmm. we are in Ohio. Um, in some really high-end grocery stores. But again, for the majority of, especially the rural people, is we've gotten rid of our farms and we've gone to the Dollar General. And I would say there's yeah. nothing in the Dollar General that actually comes from a farm. It all comes from a producer. Yeah, well, they may have, yeah. They, yeah, yeah defining farms the way you would, I think that's probably an accurate statement. But I mean, again, they do in our Dollar General, there is a little tiny six foot uh, cold case where they carry things like strawberries and they have, you know, individually wrapped baking potatoes. Um, so right. yes, there is actual food. Now the granted the, the nutrient density of that is probably very lacking because it's going right. to be the cheapest, oldest product they can get away with. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we are, we are living in a day and age, which is, is, is rapidly turning. And, and again, I think we have to just look at the, 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 the opposite of that is the absolutely massive explosion of the healthcare industry. We now in our, in every single city have a, you know, urgent care and right. literally like if you go to, there's actually more doctor offices. Actually, this is a, this is a fact there's more doctor offices within a five mile radius than there is grocery stores. Wow. I had never that's, thought of that, but I can see it. And there's, that's incredibly scary. Mm. Um, yeah. And again, like our city, I'm on our city council and we're showing a 10% increase every single year in the cost of healthcare for the people we have. That's, that's unbearable. I mean, that's it, unbearable. You, yeah. You'll end up with that. You, that's just going to drop up the cost of <laughs> literally the cost of living. Yeah. And again, well, it is because we're having to go out and raise and, and, and increase taxes because we need more money to pay the health care of the people that work for us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very unsustainable. And we look at the health of our employees, too. I mean, that's obviously as you know, we're seeing like these these groups that we're in and all of that. And it's also it's also mind numbing and scary to just look at the health of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a incredibly scary time that we live in. I mean, obviously we have this small group of people, of farmers that are, you know, passionate about changing it. Um, but until we start to see, I think, a, a nationwide kind of real deep dive, it's only going to change as fast as people are willing to open their minds to a new you know, paradigm. I, I, I know I'm preaching to the, the choir here, but Jane Goodall, when she stopped her work on, on apes and anthropology, she, she looked around, she wanted to write one more book. Mm. And it would be a book on whatever was going to be the single most important thing that people could do to make the world a better place and address social injustices, economic, prob uh, economic problems, ecological problems, health issues. And her conclusion was the number one thing that people around the world can do to make the world a better place and always is to eat local. Mm. And I, I, I love that conclusion. I think it, it is so spot on. And I think until people understand the importance of uh, eating from where they live, that these problems are are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. they, uh, if you're not eating locally, that means that you're eating industrially. And mm -hmm. that's, that's just not a good solution. Are you talking about her, the Book of Hope? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So it actually yeah. just came out real recently. Oh, 21. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty recently, but yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we could keep talking for hours, but um, hey, I appreciate your time today. I feel like we've we've talked about a fair number of things. One thing I would say, one final question we have here, or a couple here. Um, if you could go back to when you started being really involved in the farm and like change like one major thing, is there anything specific that you would change? Yes. 
there's a tendency of people to say, I'll use a metaphor here. Uh, I want to be a professional athlete. And when I become a professional athlete, then I'm going to start training like a professional athlete. That doesn't work. The mm -hmm. only way that you can become a professional athlete is to start training like a professional athlete today. And you won't be as good as a professional athlete, but that's the way you're going to train in order to get better. And we didn't do enough of that. We, we said, yeah, as we get bigger, we'll do things the way they need to be done. But in the meantime, we'll sort of make mm. new. And so just as a real simple example, we didn't come up with any sort of facilities plan that mirrored what we need to, what we wanted to do as a business. Mm. And so we, we, we built facilities that were too small and that weren't going to connect up and weren't allow us to, to grow. We ended up having to, uh, redo things over and over again and i just if i if i could go back and change anything it would be that just mm -hmm. develop the mindset of become the business today that you want to be tomorrow and even though you you can't afford everything you can at least start thinking and planning for the business you want to be as opposed to the one that you have today and i think that's that's an important mm. mistake that we made Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you on that. I would say in our farm here, we started in 2020 and we're only a couple of years old, but we're already starting to see the growing pains. Like we don't have enough freezer space or cooler space Yeah, and just how everything's set up. Like we just put a 550 square foot store in and we're already realizing uh, we've outgrown this store yeah. with what we want to do. Um, yeah. You know, one of our marketing guy was like, hey, you realize there's no deli in your store <laughs> and, and, and your town. And he's like, I really think that's an opportunity for you guys to do. And I was like, well, I never thought we would do that. But I hear what he's saying. Again, if our mission is to provide a source of good food to our community, a good deli is actually some a way to reach people in our community. Um, because let's face it, not everyone's going to eat salad and tomatoes for lunch. Sure, sure. No, that makes perfect sense. My, my own horror story in that regard is, uh, over my lifetime, I've on on our farm, I have mm -hmm. built six different handling facilities for cattle. Oh gosh! And every time it was like, well, you know, we've outgrown this. Now we have to build another one. And uh, it, you would think that eventually it would click that hey, instead of having to start over and build from scratch because we never built them that could be added on to. We just oh, weren't smart enough to do that. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. I mean. Is that it didn't make sense for you to build a a fifty thousand foot retail outlet to begin Correct. with. But you needed to think through, well, how big do we want to become and and design things so that you could grow? And that's something that we failed to do. Well, and I think that is a point that a lot of people have no idea of what their business could become. And I think, you know, trying to think that and trying to help, and sometimes you will never know. And so sometimes you just have to give yourself, well, we thought that, but it didn't end up being that. But I think a lot of times we say like, what, what would three years look like? Or what would five years look like if we keep on this? Mm -hmm. And in our case, <laughs> it means a lot more cement and a lot more uh, steel roofing than I want to think about. <laughs> so uh, good luck on that <laughs> <laughs> all right one final question what uh -huh. would you say is your favorite tool on the farm i'm embarrassed to say but it's a smartphone mm. no there's nothing with that it's it's incredibly valuable yeah i don't i don't know how people work without it because uh you know it as much as there's as we're all mobile and as much information as it takes, as many people as we have involved in the farm. I mean, we're not a huge operation, but on um, you know, it'd be an unusual day for us to have less than seven people working on the farm. Mm -hmm. And I, on a big day, we might have eleven people on the farm. Well, how in the world are you going to manage a crew of seven or eleven and, and keep the information flowing that you need without a smartphone? So, I I'm addicted to my phone. I admit it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your your uh, wisdom and experience and um, your unique take on things. I think it's really great that you have, you know, obviously the very business side of things because that's what you are, a professor, um, but also sharing how you've built your farm and kind of what the goals you are headed with that. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the conversation and you're doing important work. Keep it up and good luck to you. All right. Thank you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. 
So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.